Good afternoon. My name is Hans H. Stein, and I'm a professor at the University of Illinois in the Department of Animal Sciences. And I would like to talk today about some exciting news about swine nutrition because we've just received news that the National Academies of Sciences, they have released the next version of the nutrient requirements of swine, which is also what we call the swine NRC. So I'll talk a little bit about the process that has led to this point where we are getting a new NRC for swine, and I'll also briefly discuss some of the highlights of this new publication. The first nutrient requirements for swine was published in 1944. It was a relatively small publication, but it's been updated many times, and the last version we got was in 1998, and that was the tense revised edition. And the 10th revised edition of the NRC for swine has served us well and has been used all over the world for the past 14 years. However, it did become clear several years ago that there was a need for a new swine NRC. And one of the reasons is that we are using ingredients today that were not widely used in 1998. These ingredients include ingredients from the biofuels industry, and also some of the new soybean products that are now available. And in addition, the genetic development in pigs are such that nutrient requirements of pigs today are different from what they were 14 years ago. We also have new technologies in form of ractopamine treatment and other technologies that are available today that were not available 14 years ago. So for these reasons, it was clear that we do need to update these requirement estimates for pigs. And therefore, approximately five years ago, work started to assemble this information. And in the beginning of 2009, the National Academies committed to a new swine NRC. And in February 2009, project proposal was written. However, these requirement books need to be funded. So it was important to secure funding for the publication before the work could be done. That was done in the spring of 2009, and during the summer and fall of 2009, the new committee was assembled, and the committee started working in 2010, and worked throughout 2010 and 2011, and the last revision of the report was delivered to the National Academies by the end of 2011. So the report we have now is a result of several years of work by the committee. The funding for the project was secured from the National Pork Board, the Illinois Corn Marketing Board, the Nebraska Corn Board, the Minnesota Corn Growers Association, the Food and Drug Administration, and the American Feed Industry Association via their iFeeder organization. And finally, some internal NRC funds were also used. We are grateful to the sponsors of the publication that they were willing to step up and fund this new swine NRC. Without their support, we would not have had a new swine NRC today. The statement of task that the National Academies developed for the committee included that we had to update energy and nutrient requirements for all phases of production. We also had to include feed ingredients from the biofuels industry in the publication and other new ingredients, including new soybean products that are now available to the industry. The statement of task also included a requirement that values for digestible phosphorus for ingredients and for animal requirements should be included in the publication, and effects of feed processing should be mentioned also in the publication. The statement of task also included recommendations that the committee would include strategies to increase nutrient retention and reduce nutrient excretion from pigs. The committee was asked to expand the feed composition tables, to update the computer model, and also to identify needs for future research. So these were the tasks that the committee were asked to work through and include in the final document. The committee that was appointed by the National Academies consisted of 10 members. Dr. Lee Southern from Louisiana State University was the chairman of the committee, and other committee members included 
Dr. Jack Odell from North Carolina State University, Dr. Brian Kerr from USDA ARS in Ames, Iowa, Dr. Case DeLange from Guelph University in Canada, Dr. Phil Miller from University of Nebraska, Dr. Merlin Lindemann from University of Kentucky, Dr. Gretchen Hill from Michigan State University, Dr. Lai Adiola from Purdue University, Hans A. Stein from University of Illinois, and Dr. Natalie Trottier from Michigan State University. So this is a committee that conducted the work to fulfill the statement of tasks and to complete the new SWINE NRC. Results of the efforts from the committee are now evident in the new Neutron Requirements of SWINE, the 11th revised edition. This publication includes 400 pages, 17 chapters, and information about 122 feed ingredients. In the first chapter, there's a comprehensive description of energy systems that are used in swine production. There's mention of energy digestibility, of fasting heat production, also called maintenance energy, and of factors that influence energy retention, and also effect of the physiological state of the animal on energy retention. Environmental effects on energy needs are also included in the description, and that includes mentioning of energy needs for immunocastrated barrels and also energy needs of pigs that are treated with ractopamine. The net energy values that are calculated in the new swine NRC are based on equations from Dr. Noble in France. Chapter 2 deals with amino acids. There's mentioning of amino acid digestibility, amino acid metabolism, and amino acid composition of body pools. The description of the amino acid composition of body pools is greatly expanded and includes many different pools, in particular in sows. There's an updated ideal protein, and there's also mentioning of efficiency of utilization of different amino acids. Amino acid requirements for different groups of pigs are included, and there are data for immunocastrated pigs and also for pigs fed ractopamine. Here's an example of how the committee determined amino acid requirements. The committee looked at different experiments in which amino acid requirements have been determined based on different body weights. These observations were plotted and a regression line was drawn through the requirement estimates and therefore the estimate of requirements for each body weight of pigs could be determined. Chapter 3 is a new chapter and it is about lipids, and it mentions the digestibility and the energy values of different sources of lipids. It raises some questions on the net energy of lipids, and it also mentions essential and bioactive lipids that may be included in feed ingredients. Issues related to the iodine values and pork fat quality of pigs fed different sources of lipids are included in this chapter, and the quality of dietary fats is also mentioned. Finally, there's a comprehensive description of analysis needed to analyze for fat in feed ingredients. Chapter 4 is also a new chapter. It deals with carbohydrates and it describes the classification of carbohydrates into monosaccharides, disaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. It describes different types of dietary fibers and there's mentioning about analysis of carbohydrates and specifically about dietary fibers. Digestibility of the different carbohydrate fractions is also mentioned in this chapter. Water, of course, is one of the six classes of nutrients and it is an essential nutrient for pigs. Chapter 5 is a water chapter and it mainly goes through the quality of water that is needed by pigs and also the requirement of water that is needed by pigs. Chapter 6 is a minerals chapter, and there's mentioning here of different mineral sources and also mineral digestibility and availability. One of the new aspects of the 11th edition of the Swine NRC is that a new evaluation system of phosphorus is introduced. It's called the Standardized Total Tract Digestibility of Phosphorus. 
that system involves determining the standardized total truck digestibility of phosphorus in all feed ingredients and also determining the requirement of standardized total truck digestible phosphorus for all groups of pigs. So for all feed ingredients included in the publication, there are estimates of the standardized total truck digestibility of phosphorus, and for all groups of pigs, there are estimates of the requirement for standardized total truck digestibility of phosphorus. The reason the committee included standardized total truck digestibility of phosphorus in the publication is that it is believed to give a more accurate estimate of requirements and therefore result in less excretion of phosphorus from the animals. This chapter also discusses effects of microbial phytase on digestibility of phosphorus and there are requirement estimates for all the minerals that need to be included in diets fed to pigs. Phosphorus retention is modeled from the nitrogen retention which is also a new aspect in this publication and in addition the sodium requirement is increased compared with previous estimates. The minerals chapter is therefore expanded and contains several new aspects due to new knowledge about phosphorus, calcium and sodium requirements of pigs. Here's an example of how the requirements for standardized total tract digestible phosphorus were determined. Results of Several estimates for phosphorus requirements were recalculated based on standardized total tract digestibility values and it was then possible to draw a regression line through these estimates and come up with estimates for different weight groups of pigs. Chapter 7 is a vitamins chapter. Unfortunately, there's not much new information about vitamin requirements for pigs and the requirements therefore mostly follow the requirements from the 1998 version of the nutrient requirements of swine. There is, however, a short description of each vitamin that is included in diets fed to pigs. Chapter 8 describes a model that is used to estimate nutrient requirements for pigs, and there are three models included here, one for growing finishing pigs, one for gestating sows, and one for lactating sows. There is, however, no model for pigs of less than 20 kilograms because the committee was not comfortable with the nutrient requirements for the younger pigs. There's a description of the different models and it is possible to model the impact of ractopamine and also immunocastration on nutrient requirements of growing finishing pigs. The model also estimates the requirements for metabolizable energy, for standardized ileal digestible amino acids, for calcium, and for standardized total tract digestible phosphorus. There's also estimation of retention efficiency of different nutrients, including nitrogen and phosphorus. Here's an example of the output that can come from the model. In this case, it's the requirement for standardized ileal digestible lysine for entire males, for gills, and for barrows. And it's clear here that as pigs grow from 20 to 40 kilograms, there's very little difference in the requirement for lysine among the three groups of pigs. However, as pigs get heavier, we see that the requirements start to separate where barrows have a lower requirement for standardized ileal digestible lysine per kilogram of feed compared with gilts. However, the entire males have the greatest requirement. So this is the type of output that the model can give in terms of estimating the nutrient requirements for pigs. For sows, there's an estimate of the needs for protein for different pools in the body. In this case, is gestating sows. And there's here an estimate for the total protein deposition in the sows. But this total protein deposition is partitioned into protein deposition in the fetuses, protein deposition in the mammary gland, and protein deposition in placenta and fluids. So it's possible via this model to actually influence the different pools and if, say, litter size changes is possible to affect the specific pools that will be affected by this change. So the model can specifically estimate nutrient requirements and nutrient retentions 
in different body pools in these gestating cells. Chapter 9 is a new chapter. It contains a description of co-products from the corn and soybean industries. And the reason this chapter is included is that specifically from corn and soybeans, we have a number of new ingredients that have not previously been described and been included in nutrient requirement tables for swine. So here we have a description of co-products from the ethanol and biodiesel industries, and there's a definition of each ingredient and also a description of differences between ingredients. As an example, it's clearly described what the difference between corn germ and corn germ meal is, or fermented soybean meal versus soy protein concentrate, and there are many other ingredients mentioned in this chapter. The digestibilities of energy and nutrients in each of these products is mentioned, but more detailed information about each ingredient is also included in the ingredient tables that are included in the new swine NRC. Chapter 10 is a chapter that describes what's called the non-nutritive feed additives. So there's an overview here over products that may be included in swine diets to provide attributes to the diet that are different from the traditional nutrients needed by pigs. Products in this category include antibiotic growth promoters, probiotics, acidifiers, plant extracts, and many other products. There's a description of feed enzymes, of feed flavors, of mycotoxin binders, pellet binders, flow agents, and other products that may be added to diet fed to pigs. And there's also a description of ractopamine, which in the United States is called paline, which may also be included in diets fed to pigs. The chapter gives a short overview over each of these additives and discusses whether or not it is advantageous to include the additives in the diet and under which circumstances a positive effect of each additive can be expected. Chapter 11 is a new chapter. It describes different contaminants that may be included in feed. And these contaminants, of course, are unwanted contaminants. The fact that this chapter is included in the new swine NRC does not indicate that we in the United States have a problem with feed contaminants. Fortunately, until now, we have not had many issues with feed contaminants. We have not seen the problems with some of the contaminants that have been reported from Europe over the last few years. However, the committee felt that it is important that anyone working in the feed industry is aware of the contaminants that may be included in feed ingredients or diets. And these contaminants include pesticides, mycotoxins, heavy metals, melamine, dioxin, nickel, and many other contaminants. These are called chemical contaminants. They are also biological contaminants that include what's called TSE, which is the agent that causes mad cow disease. And there could also be bacteria such as E. coli or salmonella in feed ingredients, which may contaminate the diet that we are producing. Finally, there may be physical contaminants such as metal, glass, plastic, vermin carcasses, etc., that could be included in feed ingredients. And it is important that these contaminants are sorted out before the feed ingredient is used in diets fed to pigs. So the chapter gives an overview over possible feed contaminants. And as I said before, the fact that the chapter is included in the new swine in a seed does not indicate there is a problem, but the committee wanted to be on the forefront of these issues because we have seen in some other countries that feed contaminants have become big issues. Chapter 12 is also a new chapter that was included in response to the statement of task, and it deals with feed processing and includes discussion about grinding and pelleting, micronization, expansion, extrusion, conditioning, and other types of processing that may be used to increase the nutritive value of feed ingredients. There's a discussion about the effect of each of these technologies on nutrient utilization by pigs. Chapter 13 
is also a new chapter and it deals with digestibility of nutrients and energy. In this chapter, procedures for determining energy and nutrient digestibility are described and equations that are needed to calculate these values are also provided. Endogenous loss of nutrients is discussed in detail and procedures for calculating apparent, standardized and true digestibility of nutrients are provided. The difference between apparent and standardized or apparent and true digestibility is also described. It is concluded that for amino acids, the most accurate values are based on standardized ileal digestibility of amino acids. For lipids, the most accurate values are obtained if the true ileal digestible lipids are calculated or determined. For carbohydrates, it can be the apparent ileal digestibility or the apparent total tract digestibility depending on which group of carbohydrates are discussed. If we are dealing with disaccharides or starch, the apparent ileal digestibility values are the most accurate, whereas for the oligosaccharides and for the non-starch polysaccharides, the apparent total tract digestibility values need to be determined. For phosphorus, it's a standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus that need to be determined, as previously discussed, and for energy, there is discussion about determination of digestible energy and metabolizable energy. It is the objective of this chapter to give a background for all the values that are included in the feed ingredient tables in the publication. Chapter 14 deals with nutrient excretion because it is recognized that livestock production is not possible without excretion of some nutrients in this chapter, there's a discussion about the excretion of nitrogen, calcium and phosphorus, sulfur, microminerals, carbon, and also gases that may be emitted from livestock production. Estimates of the quantities of each nutrient that may be emitted are also given, and discussions about possibilities for reducing the emissions are included in this chapter. Chapter 15 is a new chapter that is also included in response to the statement of task that the committee was given, and it includes a discussion about the needs for further research in the area of swine nutrition. As the committee went through the literature that had been published over the last few years, it became clear that specifically for sows, there's a need for more information about requirements for amino acids, calcium, and phosphorus. And one of the reasons for this is that the sows we have today are much more prolific than sows we had just a few years ago, and it is therefore necessary that we re-examine the requirements of nutrients for these animals. Specifically for calcium, there is a need for determining the digestibility of calcium in all feed ingredients that contribute calcium to the diets, and we also need to have more information about the requirements of calcium in pigs. There's very little new information about vitamins and in many of our newer feed ingredients, we don't have good estimates of the vitamin concentration, so this is clearly an area where we need to have more data. Energy values and specifically digestibility values for lipids are also needed because lipids contribute greatly to the energy of feed ingredients, but we don't have good estimates of the digestibility of lipids in the ingredients. Values for composition and digestibility of nutrients in feed ingredients will continue to be an area where new information is needed as we get access to new feed ingredients, new co-products, and as some of our common feed ingredients change in response to genetic developments in agronomy. Effects of enzymes and other additives on nutrient requirements also need to be emphasized in future research, and the environmental impact of swine production needs to be assessed and procedures for reducing the excretion of nutrients from swine need to be identified. So these are some of the major areas in which new research is needed during the next decade. Chapter 16 includes all the nutrient requirement tables. There are tables for growing finishing pigs and for growing finishing pigs from 20 to 135 kilogram body weight, there are requirement estimates for pigs with a low or a medium or a high lean gain that 
is equivalent to 115, 135 or 155 grams of protein deposition per day. And each of these three groups of pigs have separate requirements which are included in these tables. There are tables for the requirement of pigs where the sexes are mixed, but there are also tables separately for the requirements for barrows, for gills, and for intact boars. There are specific tables for pigs that are less than 20 kilograms, and in this case, the lysine requirement is based on empirical studies, and the ideal protein is then used to estimate the requirement for other amino acids. For sows, there are tables both for gestating and lactating sows, and there are different estimates of nutrient requirements for sows of different weights and also for sows with different litter sizes. It should be emphasized that the tables do not include safety margins, so the requirements that are listed in the tables are those requirements that are believed to cover the requirements for all nutrients in the animals but without any safety margins. Chapter 17 is the feed composition tables. This chapter includes 122 feed ingredients. Information about each feed ingredient was obtained by scanning the peer-reviewed literature over the last 15 years. And all information that has been published in the peer-reviewed literature about these 122 feed ingredients was included in the tables. For each feed ingredient, there's information about the composition of nutrients. There's also information about the number of observations that went into each number in the tables. And a standard deviation for each number is included in the table. The information about the feed ingredients include information about proximate analysis, about carbohydrates, amino acids, minerals, vitamins, fatty acids, and different types of energy in the ingredient. However, it is clear that for many ingredients, not all this information is available, so there are some blank spaces in these tables for some of the ingredients, and these blank spaces can be used as a guide to where information is needed in the future. However, the feed composition tables represent the best available information that the committee could obtain for each of these ingredients. Here's an example of one page of the ingredient tables. In this case, it's canola meal, and the page is divided into proximal components, carbohydrates, amino acids, minerals, vitamins, and fatty acids. And as it appears from the table, they are not only an average of each component given here, but also the number of observations that went into that average and the standard deviation. It is the objective of this approach to give readers an appreciation of the variability that can be expected for each nutrient in a given feed ingredient. So in conclusion, the committee conducted a considerable amount of work to complete the new Swine NRC. The work was completed in 18 months. Most readers will find that the efforts did not result in a perfect document, but hopefully it's a great step forward with lots of new information and with lots of updated information that will make it more accurate to formulate diets fed to pigs. The chapter of the identification of research needs may also help guide future research, which hopefully will result in even bigger accomplishments in the future. And it is already evident that we need to start thinking about the next revision of the Swine NRC because the time it takes from a revision is decided and until a revision is completed, it is not too early to start thinking about when and how to do the next revision. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I encourage everybody to read the new Swine NRC I'm confident that most readers will find it interesting and hopefully also helpful to read the document and that they'll be able to formulate diets for pigs more accurately than they were before. Thank you very much for your attention.